Okay, we're crafting with Kay. How are we all doing? So, welcome to my new segment called The Reading Nook. Um, I reached out to uh, an excellent author called Sharon Hannaford, and she uh, gladly gave me permission to read her Hellcat series to you. Uh, she's one of my top two favourite authors of all time. I have a couple of mugs, so fill up a cup and drink, and yeah, join us for the project. So, what perfect diet and painting to use is the little dragon <laughs> reading a book, drinking a drink, cozying up for the night, really, <laughs> really for the evening. So yeah, grab a project, grab a drink, and yeah, listen along. Uh, just a heads up, I'm not the best at reading out loud, so I will probably butcher some names, uh, but please, <laughs> I will get there in the end. Either way, I hope you enjoy uh, this new segment. Take care, guys. Enjoy. Chapter 5. Carl sat calmly through her ranting and raving about the witch not only being allowed in her house, but allowed behind the wheel of a car. Then adding insult to injury, she was banned from going out on patrol tonight. His vague amusement only served to annoy her further. Even Rose bringing her a second cup of coffee wasn't doing much to improve her mood. Carl tried another angle, trying to mollify her. You've been moaning for weeks that all you ever do is work and hunt, and that you've forgotten what a normal person does at night. Why don't we make the most of an official day and night off and do something normal? She scowled at him. The idea actually had some appeal, but she wasn't going to accept defeat graciously. Come on, he cajoled. We'll do something we haven't done in ages. Maybe go to a movie or a show and then hit the city for dinner and drinks. It'll be fun. We haven't done anything like that for months. Fun, huh? She sounded doubtful. I've probably got work to do anyway she said, thinking about the fact that she didn't know what animal work she had booked for today. No, you haven't, he announced. I checked your diary and your email already. You have nothing urgent on, just a whole day and night of R&R. &R. Fine, smartass, she finally capitulated. If it'll stop you badgering me, we'll do a 3D movie or something equally mindless. Then we'll go out drinking and looking for trouble. Tomorrow morning, we're going to go see Ian first thing and we'll be back on patrol by tomorrow night. Suddenly, the gentle sizzle and delicious smell of frying bacon wafted in the kitchen, and Gabby saw Carl react as instantly as her. They both perked up and headed to the kitchen, as if tugged on by their nose. Oh, Rose, you know how to make a person feel better in the morning, Gabby sighed, taking a stool at the counter and pulling another one out beside her. Carl pulled the next one out, knowing that the one next to her was reserved for Slinky or Razor, whichever one got there first. Rose chuckled cheerfully. I've spent many years feeding shifters. I know how to fill bottomless pits. Then she sighed. If only I had the same metabolism as all of you, then I wouldn't have to avoid all my favourite desserts and sweets. She patted her ample hips before whisking up some eggs in a glass bowl. Gabby smiled, shook her head. Rose was always going on about her weight and trying every new exercise machine that came out in the market. But she somehow always seemed to stay the same build. Not that she was excessively overweight. Just on the voluptuous side, with an ample bosom and curvaceous hips. Rose, you know real men like a bit of junk in the trunk, and cleavage big enough to hold a beer can. That man of yours is as happy as a drunkard locked in a brewery. He'd go off on you if you ever got as skinny as me, Gabby reassured the older woman. Rose giggled girlishly at the mention of her husband's preference for meat on a woman. Although married for over 30 years, Gabby knew they still thoroughly enjoyed each other's company. And other things... Rose covered her blushing cheeks by turning away to pour the egg mixture into a pan. She bustled happily around the kitchen, enjoying having the two younger people to cater for. She put mounds of food on the counter and plates in front of each of them, adding a smaller plate next to Gabby for Slinky, who had arrived for breakfast too. Carl, Carl scooped up some scrambled eggs onto a smaller plate and added a few pieces of lean bacon, the ferret's favourite, placing it close to Slinky's whis whiskery face. He then snagged Gabby's plate, piled on food and handed it over to her before doing the same for himself, smiling appreciatively at Rose as she brought yet more coffee over. Thanks Rose, you're an absolute gem, he enthused. Anytime Gabby mistreats you or you get tired of cleaning up after Razor, you know you're always welcome at my house, he teased. Gabby smacked him on the shoulder with the back of her hand over Slinky's head. Watch yourself, mutt, she warned with a mocking growl around a mouthful of hot sausage. I'll revoke your breakfast privileges and set Raz on you. Hey, he protested. I just fed Stinky for you. I'm earning my keep, he said, nodding towards Slinky, who was happily scoffing his morning treat. 
They bantered until the piles of food were all but gone and their appetite sated. Then Carl got up to help Rose clear away the dishes and pack the dishwasher. They both steered Gabby away when she attempted to help, joking that she was bad enough when she could see clearly. Rose didn't need any broken crockery to clear up. Fine, she pretended to fume. I know when I'm not wanted. I'm going back to bed. She hefted Razor off the floor as he came wandering in and stalked off down the corridor to catch up on sleep. Rose woke her mid-afternoon to say she was on her way home and had left lunch for Gabby in the fridge and Carl had gone home to change and would be back soon. Gabby thanked her sleepily and, con and considered going back to sleep until Carl got back. Her anxiety about her eyesight overrode the need for more sleep and she forced her eyes open to assess the current condition. She was pleasantly surprised to find the grey fog had almost gone. Those things were still a little out of focus, almost like she was wearing a pair of someone else's prescription glasses. When she got up and went to the bathroom to look at herself in the mirror, she was met with a somewhat blurry but unclouded view of herself. It wasn't a pretty sight. Her hair was a jumbled mess of knotted curls and a burn mark on her cheek was an angry red blister with slight puckering around the edges. She grimaced, shower first, burn cream second, lunch third, she decided. By the time Carl got back, she was dressed and eating sandwiches at her computer, squinting hugely to try and make out the printing on the screen. The vision that much better, he asked surprised, plonking down onto a spare of his chair and kicking his feet up onto a large mahogany desk. Good enough to take you on at some pool after a movie, she challenged. You're on, babe, he declared. But don't cry foul when I whip your ass. In your dreams, wolf boy, she taunted. She gave up trying to read the print on the screen. It was giving her a headache. Carl followed her out of the office and lounged in one of the undamaged armchairs in the now sparsely furnished but tidy sitting room. While she filled up Razor's food bowl to overflowing and slapped some cover up over the angry red mark on her face. The blisters on her fingers weren't as serious. They were almost healed but still tender. Then she slid Nix into her sheath down the back of her shirt, rearranging her hair and collar to cover the top of the hilt. Lastly, she tucked two butterfly swords into the sheath hidden by her black leather boots. A discreet slit in the jeans gave her easy access to them in a pinch. Carl shook his head sadly. She quirked an eyebrow at him. What? she demanded. Can't a girl go out prepared? You know I feel naked without some protection. He rolled his eyes but held his tongue. She knew he would have at least three weapons hidden in various places on his body as well. No hunter ever went out unarmed. They all still cursed the law, ban banning handguns in the city. It was far easier taking out a rogue from a distance than hand to hand, but they knew the penalties of using a firearm. The alarms raised by someone reporting gunshots resulted in far too much interest from the police. Then she remembered that guns did little to stop demons and ghouls, and to a lesser extent vampires, was grateful for her swords and daggers. Let's go, warfare Barbie, he teased her wickedly, then ducking as she held her car keys at his head with de deadly accuracy. She threw a black knitted wrap over one arm and st stalked hauntingly out to the car. Her car was a Ford Mustang Shelby GT500, the new model, red of course, with black Le Mans racing stripes. Gabby pretended to have no real interest in cars and machines, not dying to enter discussions about things like torque and horsepower but she loved the power and handling of this supercharged muscle car. She had a friend who was a pro racing driver who'd made sure she knew how to handle the wild beast. She rarely let anyone else touch it, let alone drive it, which is why she'd been so pissed off at the thought of Athena getting her paws on it. Carl couldn't contain his grin at the prospect of getting to drive it. It was during their third game of pool that Gabby spotted him the first time. She'd felt the tingling presence of a vampire when she automatically cast out her supernatural senses as they entered the bar. It was one of her special talents, this ability to feel the presence of other non-humans. But with so many people moving around in such a relatively small area, it was difficult to pick out the vamp from the humans. So she couldn't pinpoint him right at the beginning. She decided to adopt a wait-and-see approach. Not all vampires were up to no good. She sent Carl to the bar for drinks while she racked up the pools on the pool table. Both of them played atrocious pool. Between her sore fingers and poor vision and him not quite healed and he's not quite healed injuries, they were both at a disadvantage, but they, but as they were fairly evenly matched, they continued to play, ragging on each other as they progressively played worse and worse. Suddenly, Gabby glanced up. 
instantly alert. She'd felt the power of a vampire brush the edge of her senses. That was strange. Vamps normally did their utmost to blend in, rarely using their power so blatantly in a crowded place, in case, a new, in case another supernatural was present. Gabby noticed Carl had gone on the alert as well. The ability to sense the use of supernatural power wasn't just a talent of Gabby's. Most other supernaturals could feel when that kind of power was being used, though Gabby seemed to get a better sense of it than most. She followed the tendril of power back to its owner and found him watching her from the nearby bar. He was tall and blonde, appearing to be in his mid-twenties, his features a little too boyish to be considered handsome. By the brush of his power, as he tried to mind-roll her, he was a relatively young vamp, still a little clumsy in his attempts at rolling humans. He was probably wondering why the hell she wasn't already making her way over to him, begging for his attention. She hadn't met a vampire yet who could mind-roll her. It seemed to be another of her talents. She figured that one day she would meet her match, but this vampire definitely wasn't it. Vamps used the mind control to call humans to them, using a kind of hypnosis to convince their target of their trustworthiness, sexual appeal or harmlessness. This allowed them to feed regularly while maintaining their cloak of secrecy. Most vamps took what they needed and left the human with memories of an erotic encounter with a seductive stranger and an unusual lethargy the following day, but no other negative side effects. Some vamps, however, were thrilled by the taking of blood involuntarily, with fear and violence. The theory was that some liked the taste of blood saturated with the adrenaline as it gave the vampire a high of sorts. Once a vamp decided this was their drug of choice, they would do anything to increase the high, often resulting to more and more brutal methods of creating fear in their victims. These were the vamps that the SMV took out of their circulation permanently. She looked away from him, pretending indifference, but fastened her senses onto his scent unobtrusively telling Carl to keep an eye on him. During the next game of pool, Carl and Gabby noticed him heading out of the bar with a cute brunette, stumbling along drunkenly beside him. He was met near the door by a dark-complexioned man, who looked the brunette up and down appraisingly before giving a curt nod to the blonde vamp and grinning malevolently as they preceded him out through the doors. That second one was a vamp too, Gabby told Carl as they watched them leave. I have a bad feeling about this. Two vamps, one girl? That story doesn't seem to have a happy ending for the girl. Let's go, Carl agreed, figuring that they could at least scare the vamps off, if necessary. The hunters could clean up properly another night. Gabby and Carl knew them by sight and scent now. They wouldn't avoid the hunters for long. They put up their cues, leaving their drinks on the table and hurried after the trio. As they exited the pool bar, they heard the girl scream from the alley behind the bar and took off at a dead run. Gabby drawing Nix and Carl unsheathing a dagger for each hand. As they rounded the corner into the alley, the two vamps whipped around, their eyes completely black and their fangs fully extended. The girl held between them was still screaming in terror. The vampires faced the hunters for a second, then looked at each other and with matching growls shoved the screaming girl right at them and took off down the alley at vampire speed. Kyle caught the girl and held her against him, stifling her screams. Gabby took off at full throttle after the escaping vampires. Gabby, no, he shouted, cursing when she didn't even slow. She pushed the girl down into an overturned crate and pulled out a phone from his pocket as he took off after Gabby and the fleeing vamps. As he got onto the end of the alley where it split onto a main road, he could see Gabby running to his right, the vamps a short distance in front of her. Gabby, he yelled again, trying to get her to quit the chase. The next second, one of the vamps split off from the main road, heading down another alley, while the other continued straight. Gabby sent him hand signals telling him to follow the one who had split off, weaving between the late night party goers. Carl sighed in exacerbation and took off after the blonde vampire, as he explained to the Magi who answered his call where to find the girl. Gabby kept up her pursuit of the darker vampire without actually engaging him. They were jogging now, keeping to an acceptable human speed. She didn't want to start anything with him while there were potential spectators and he, and he seemed to be counting on that staying in the main streets and heading deeper into the city centre. Abruptly, he disappeared down a side street. Gabby checked around her briefly before following him. They were kilometres from the pool bar already, and Gabby wondered how Carl was faring with Blondie, or if he'd gone back to take care of the girl. She tracked her target to the end of the side street. He was moving quicker again. There were no pedestrians on these streets, and not vehicle in sight. 
She lost the vamp for a few seconds, but picked him up flitting down a dark side alley. He was obviously hoping to give her the slip in the darkened streets. She sped up, heading for the entrance to the alley. This would be as good a place as any to take out a rogue, she figured, as she rounded the corner. Oh, shit, she thought, coming to the dead hole in the grimy alley. I knew there was something odd about this fucking vampire's behaviour, she muttered to herself, while sizing up the six vampires who were steadily moving in on her. The two from the pool bar now stood calmly in front of her. Another two moved out of the shadows behind her, two more from the dark entranceway from to her left. She fell into a defensive stance and cast out her senses, searching for more. But that seemed to be all of them. More than she'd like to take on alone. Damn. There were different advantages to a city. Not even a stray owl that she could use as a distraction. Nex was still in her right hand, but with a twitch of her left arm she hooked a butterfly sword from her boot. Then she took a deep breath. Well, what do you know, she sneered at the two closest vampires. The rogues have friends. She casually moved to position her back against the right side of the alley. Now she had all six in her immediate view. The two coming up from the entrance to the alley were the closest to her now, less than 20 metres away. They were both male and heavy set mus- and muscular. One was slightly taller than the other, but besides that they could have been twins. The taller one spoke. There's no need for bloodshed tonight, he said in a deep rumble. His voice had an odd formal cast to it, which seemed wholly out of place in this reeking alley. Our master would like to meet with you. He sent us to extend an invitation. His deep voice continued in a slow, measured way. Gabby blinked, mentally thrown sideways. This was the first in her books. If this is supposed to be friendly, then I suggest you ask your friends to stop overcrowding me, she suggested evenly, eyeing the other four vampires moving closer. Two of them were the males from the bar. Another was a shorter, skinnier male with a darker complexion. She was inordinately beautiful, tall, graceful and platinum blonde, but there was a cruel set to her crimson mouth and emerald green eyes, and her whole body spoke volumes of disdain for the hunter in front of her. Deep voice gave a minuscule toss of his head towards them and they stopped, standing dead still. Only the female appeared unhappy about it. Gabby was feeling decidedly outnumbered and was trying desperately to calm her racing heart, a bright beacon of her anxiety level to the vampire's sensitive hearing. I'm still feeling rather crowded, Gabby stated flatly. If we're going to have a civilised conversation, we can do it one on one, no need for a conference. There was slight movement from the group of four as the female took another step forward. I don't think you're precisely in a position to give orders, the female spat in Gabby's direction. Her accent seemed to have a touch of French in it. That explained a few things. Genevieve! Deep voice cautioned with an increased rumble in his voice. We are not here to intimidate her. And Jelly Morte. Puh! Spat the female with a sneer, thrown in Gabby's direction. She's just a pitiful scrap of semi-humanity. Who, what good could she do anybody? Deep voice threw himself up to his full height and turned towards the female with exacerbation on his face. But Gabby sc- simply ignored the female. If you're not here to intimidate me, then why did he send six of you? She directed her question at Deep Voice, and his brother acting as though the female did not exist. Deep Voice threw one more threatening glance at Genevieve's way, then visibly calmed herself before replying. The master simply wanted to get your attention without any bloodshed. He felt extra numbers would make you less likely to attack us on sight. Six against one? She asked incredulously. Deep Voice inclined his head slightly, almost respectfully. Your reputation precedes you, Miss Bradford. Gabby raised one eyebrow. These vampires were well informed. Members of the SMV tended to keep their identities as secret as possible. She was no longer holding a fighting crouch, but she hadn't relaxed her defences. She still held both swords in her hands, her wrists crossed loosely in front of her. Perhaps it would be more civilised to introduce ourselves first, Deep Voice used that odd formal candence again. I am Liam, and this is Nathan. He inclined his head towards the vampire next to him. He was purposely making very few movements, Gabby noted, or she trying not to startle her. You have met Genevieve. Well, I heard a dog bark anyway, Gabby interrupted. Genevieve shrieked and launched herself straight at Gabby in a flurry of fangs and nails. When was she ever going to learn to keep her big mouth shut? No, Liam growled, leaping forward. Stop! He was too late, by a fraction of a second. Genevieve blew past him and launched herself directly at Gabby. Gabby's arms raised and her swords flashed outwards in a single fluid motion. 
The two of them flew backwards as Genevieve collided with Gabby and they landed in a tumbled heap against the far brick wall. The fight was over in seconds, both of them using every ounce of strength and speed to rip into each other. When they suddenly broke apart, Genevieve was still shrieking, but this time in disbelief. She reared away from Gabby, her eyes wired and her hand clutching at the, blang- at the blade sunk deep into her chest. She stumbled several metres backwards, for once completely ungraceful. Her body suddenly stiffened as a single drop of blood trickled from the corner of her mouth, and she collapsed onto the ground. Gabby was already picking herself off the street, leaning on the wall, assessing her own body. But there was no time to do more than make sure she could stand. The other vamps, shocked into stillness for the briefest of seconds, leapt into the action. The blonde one from the bar broke from the pack and streaked towards Genevieve inhumanly fast. No! He roared hoarsely as he reached her. He watched in stark disbelief as her corpse began to mummify in front of him. Gabby hadn't been formally introduced to this male yet, but he obviously cared for the very beautiful and now very dead Genevieve. Then he looked up at Gabby with rage twisting his pale features. You bitch! He screamed, bearing his pale glistening fangs viciously. He began to stalk towards her. Liam and Nathan threw themselves into the small space between the pissed off vampire and Gabby, while the other two hung back, seeming bemused by the turn of events. Gabby pulled in a, a ragged breath and switched next to her left hand. Her right arm wasn't following orders, and the butterfly sword was still sticking out of Genevieve's decaying corpse. She could feel blood seeping down her right arm. Not a good thing when surrounded by excited vampires. Time for Elvis to leave the building, she decided. Stefan, no! Liam ordered in a stern voice. The master has offered her his protection. To attack her means death. She hasn't accepted his offer yet, has she? Stefan bellowed back. Get out of my way, I will avenge Genevieve's death. Genevieve attacked first. There is nothing to avenge. Angeli Morte had the right to defend herself. Liam moved towards Stefan, apparently trying to force him to step back. Stefan suddenly cowered down slightly, appearing to acquiesce. Liam reacted. Liam relaxed minutely and then Steve, and then Stefan leapt into the air and soared over their heads, somersaulting before landing inches from, Grab- from Gabby in an aggressive crouch. He didn't pause for so much as half a second before diving straight towards her. Time almost stood still as Gabby took one quick step to the right, spinning herself away from an enraged vampire like a matador, changing the grip on her sword so that she held it point downwards in her fist in the same instant. She noted the other vampires rushing forward, but they would be an instant too late. She continued her spin like a dancer and brought the short sword up in a backwards thrust. She used all the force of her weight and spin to drive the sword deep into Stefan's back. She didn't wait to check that she had hit his heart. She yanked necks out of his body, hissing as pain lanced through her right side and took off in a dead sprint back down the alley. She could sense them following as she raced through the dark empty streets. Only four, so Stefan was either dead or severely injured. Her breath was coming in ragged gasps, and the pain in her arm and chest was sharpening with every stride. Two of them suddenly streaked ahead slightly to the right of her, so they thought they could ambush her again. Fortunately, she knew this part of the city well. She made an abrupt left turn onto another side street. There was a well-hidden fire escape just a few hundred metres down. This would get her onto the rooftops. Hopefully it would take the vampires a couple of minutes to realise she was no longer on street level. She stopped up the ladder to catch her breath and to steal herself for the climbing up the ladder. Her right arm still wasn't working right. She was guessing at dislocation, and she definitely heard something crack when she'd been crushed between Genevieve and the brick wall. Arm? Collarbone? Probably a few ribs too. She took more, sh- she took more shallow breaths, slipped next back into her sheath and grabbed hold of the ladder, hoping she'd have time to pull her phone and call Carl once she got to the top. She scanned for the vampires and felt a huge surge of adrenaline as she realised two of them were at the entrance to the side street. She didn't bother trying to find the other two. She just threw all of her concentration into the clumpersome task of climbing the ladder one-handed. She reached the top and rolled onto the flat roof, biting back a groan as she stood up. She could now sense the other two vampires coming from the right at roof level, the first two almost up the ladder. Gabby crouched down and ran for the nearest shadows. There was another building with a flat roof about three metres jump from this one. She angled for a spot that she knew was the easiest to jump from. Normally, this would have been an easy jump for her, but she wasn't feeling particularly confident right now. She was out of options, however, so she left the shadows and started towards the edge of the roof, resisting the urge to let out a groan. She stopped dead in her tracks when she became aware of two vampires appearing on the roof of the adjoining building. 
Then a very masculine voice spoke from the dark behind her. Good evening, Miss Bradford, the husky male voice said, strangely polite. Or may I call you Gabrielle? She turned around very slowly, realising she was once again surrounded. A tall man stepped out of the shadows and walked with noiseless grace towards her. Oh, shit, 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 Gabby thought desperately. Her inbuilt vamp meter was telling her this vampire was enormously powerful. As he stepped into the light cast from the taller building, she could see more of the newcomer. He was very tall, well over the six feet mark. His broad shoulders were emphasised by a full-length leather coat that she couldn't help thinking must have been tailor-made to fit him. His hair was slightly longer than fashionable, in varying shades of dark blonde and brown, and curling softly onto his collar. His face could have easily been on the corner of one of the, a dozen fashion ma magazines. He was the optimum of maleness in the hard angles of his cheekbones and jaw, and his dark eyebrows, off offset by a central pair of lips and eyes framed by thick, dark eyelashes that most women would give their firstborn child for. He is quite simply the most striking, attractive man Gabby had ever seen in her life. Her heart felt like it stuttered a few beats while she took him in, for before she forced her usual mask of haunty nonchalance back into place. You have me at a disadvantage, Mr... She left it hanging. She purposely stared straight into his eyes, though she was by no means sure she would be immune to such an immensely powerful vampire. He flashed a brilliant smile, clearly displaying his pearly white fangs, his expression taking on a sardonic edge. Of course, I'm being rude. Forgive me. I am not often in the company of one with such an esteemed reputation. Gabby raised her eyebrows but decided to keep her mouth shut for once. He continued, My name is Julius, and I would very much like to make your acquaintance. He was still smiling mildly at her, keeping very still and watching her reactions closely. I take it then that you are the uh, master that Liam was referring to? Gabby asked, trying to keep her voice steady. The one who wanted to meet with me? She tried to keep her voice even and not show any sign of her injuries. She resisted the urge to cradle her injured arm to her body. Openly displaying weakness in front of aggressive vampires was courting a short trip to hell. Yes, indeed, he replied. I hope my envoys were clear and polite in their extension of my invitation. He spoke slowly with measured words, his voice low and husky. She wondered if he knew how utterly mesmerising his voice was. She mentally shook herself, scanning again and realising that the vampires... and realising that the vampire numbers had now grown to over a dozen. Her heart jolted with a new surge of adrenaline. She suddenly became highly aware of the blood seeping down from her shoulder. The vampire in front of her suddenly stiffened and her left hand flashed to Nixie's help. No, he said in a flat, dead voice. It would seem they were anything but friendly. He was now radiating fury. But oddly, it didn't seem directed at Gavi. He didn't even seem to notice that she'd slipped Nick's free of her sheath. He looked over her head and bit out the words. Why is she bleeding? Gabby knew instantly why this vampire was deemed master of the city. The power rolled off him in waves. It was like standing too close to a bonfire. The male vampire stepped out of the shadows to her right. He had his head bowed deeply, but Gabby re recognised Liam's voice as he spoke. Sire, he began in a rough voice, my deepest apologies. Genevieve's temper got the bottom of, got the better of her, and the rest of us were not quick enough to intervene in time. The cold fury on the master vampire's face didn't change as he demanded, Where is Genevieve? His eyes scanned the roof quickly. Liam's head didn't lift as he answered. Miss Bradfist defended herself against Genevieve's attack, sire. So, she is gone? Julius demanded. Liam gave a quick nod of his head. Gabby tightened her grip on necks. No way was she getting out of this one alive if the master considered Genevieve's death malicious. But she would take a couple more with her, she thought fiercely. And Stefan? Julius demanded again, I right but controlled. Stefan tried to avenge Genevieve's death. Nathan and I tried to talk sense into him, but he was incensed, out of his mind. Liam shook his head sadly. You and Nathan took him down? Julius asked, sounding completely matter-of-fact, as though it was a normal occurrence. No, sire. Liam seemed to hang his head a little more. He managed to get past us. Miss Bradford took him down too. Julius's eyes flashed with something that seemed a little like surprise as he concentrated and flicked back to Gabby. A muscle twitched in his jaw as he spoke through slightly clenched teeth. 
should never have given in to Stefan's suggestion that Genevieve join the operation. I will speak to you and Nathan later. I expect a full debriefing. The threat in his voice was implicit, and Gabby almost felt sorry for Liam, if she wasn't feeling so utterly exposed herself. Gabby felt her body begin to shake and knew that the adrenaline high was about to wear off. She closed her eyes for a brief second while she tried to collect herself, and when she opened them again he was standing mere inches from her. She flinched back automatically but held her ground, tipping her head back to see his face. He looked to be assessing her, probably noting her hammering heart and quivering body. He seemed oblivious to necks held tight in her left hand. He reached for her right arm. He could obviously smell the blood seeping down from the bite Genevieve had inflicted on her shoulder. As he brought her arm up, as if to inspect it, pain slammed into her. She pulled back from him, letting out a gasp and collapsing onto her knees, her head reeling and nausea threatening to overwhelm her. She dropped necks and wrapped her left arm protectively over the right, cradling it. She closed her eyes and fought the nausea down, trying to breathe easily, feeling a cold sweat pop out on her forehead. Too late to hide the extent of her weakness now. If she'd been in any less pain, she would have been very surprised to hear his voice sounding apologetic as he crouched down in front of her. I am sorry, he said, sounding almost contrite. I was not aware that you were badly injured. You hide pain well. Too well for your own good, it seems. He sounded like he was musing to himself now. Then he suddenly became businesslike. Seems my original plan for our meeting has gone completely awry. We must see to your injuries first, but most pressingly the dislocation of your shoulder. Gabby wondered disjointedly how he knew it was dislocated. He'd hardly touched her. She brushed the thought away, trying instead to concentrate on getting to her feet and finding a way out of this mess. She briefly considered trying to bring in some bats to create enough confusion for her to escape, but quickly banished the idea, realising that these vampires weren't going to be put off by a handful of flapping mammals. As she started to try and rise, Julius put a cool, cool strong hand under her left elbow. She flinched and had to work hard not to rip her arm out of his grip. She steadied herself and allowed him to help her upright, next once again in her left hand. Then she moved back from him. He watched her move away with a brooding, pensive look on his face. I'm guessing you're not going to want to come back to our headquarters with me, so that we can get your injuries attended to and then continue with our meeting. He made it a statement of fact rather than an actual question. Gabby quirked one eyebrow upward. That would be a safe assumption to make. She was trying for polite, shooting her mouth off earlier had got her hurt, but it was her natural defence when she felt cornered. How about we all go home and think about things? We can try this again another night. She tried to, to smile winningly. A girl could always live in hope. If she got out of this one alive, she vowed she would never, never, never run off alone after a vampire again. Well, at least not for the next few weeks anyway. Hmm, Julius mused. I thought you might feel that way. Unfortunately, I brought this with me. It'll make the whole thing much le much more painless for all of us. And then he brought his hand up in front of him. There was a small black device in it. Gabby heard a sharp whistling noise as she tried to spin herself out of the way. She felt a sharp sting in her uninjured shoulder. She looked down in surprise at the small dart and, realisa and realisation arrived for too late for her to do anything about it. Her limbs began turning to jelly as she ground out the words, You bastard! through clenched teeth. She felt him take the curved sword from her numb fingers. The adrenaline and the fury coursing through her couldn't hold back the darkness. She expected, the f she expected to feel the impact with the ground as she collapsed, but instead felt the cool, hard arms catching her, lifting her up. The last thing she heard as she slipped from consciousness was his deep, sexy voice saying, It's easiest this way. Trust me. See you next time. Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs>